some of my own, the shallowness of some of my own earlier efforts, my first drafts, my earlier books and such to kind of get the message across and certainly you know, the, 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 you know, the failings of us collectively as, a, as, a, as, as other writers to, to, to necessarily speak about the elephant in the room or, or bring the stories that were, that were clearly not yet talked about there. This is the driving point. But what were the questions about the present that, that these were addressing? Uh, we had critical things to say about how some of the best work that we do uh, and aspire to do as architectural educators and, and practitioners. And I went last night to, the, to a wonderfully fancy event with all of the, many of the most uh, exciting contemporary architects uh, in India today, celebrating India's penetration into the World Architecture Awards and such, and saw the type of projects that are being done. Some lovely work, but also you know, much of it is still, as the event itself is, you know, caught in this sort of um, echo chamber of, of the beautiful and the, and, the, and the refined for the clients who understand and, and the kind of the almost irrelevance in its cosmopolitan uh, engagement with, with the local but without possibly much resonance uh, beyond. The, the challenge of how our relevance will, will, will go somewhere. The concluding arguments of our book, we're looking at how some of our fraternity are engaged in bigger infrastructural things, how infrastructure itself has been from time to time, if we think of the British as stuff in the colonial times as being architecture one way or another. Uh, it, it's, it's much more everyday, much more profound um, in terms of its implication with the, the, the society itself. You know, how are we engaging with it? In some cases, some architects uh, have had some some, some touching on to that, um, that's an open question. But what I want to just, because uh, I'm now five minutes into my, beyond my time, I'll just re revert to this script and le read you the last few words that I had scripted here. So to conclude uh, this somewhat uh, self-absorbed, self-indulgent reflection upon uh, the broader question of writing architecture. Uh, let me return to the point I made at the start. Architecture is, an autonomous, is not an autonomous object or category upon, unto itself, at least as I see it. The longer I write and teach about it, I only become more convinced how inextric uh, inextricably architecture is intertwined with the political the cultural, and the economic fabric of society. Good architectural design, as we know, may rely on good craft for its execution, but um, artful reproduction in is not in itself good design. Like good design, good architectural history entails much more than the meticulous recording and representation of historical evidence. In one way or another, it must also be a, more, uh, a mode of, of critical research into the social condition. Research about the present, that is, by way of the past. Indeed, uh, as the incoming editor of uh, one of the key European journals of architectural history has just, uh, just last week, I noticed in preparing this talk, uh, uh, observed in the context of uh, her inaugural editorial taking over this, this particular journal's um, uh, helm. Uh, she, she, she writes, and I quote, the architectural historian's uh, unique strength to provide historically informed analysis of contemporary architectural uh, phenomena is surprisingly underused. You know, we understand what people are doing now or is coming from, what sort of ideas they're building on, what sort of things they may be criticizing or or maybe not even consciously doing that, but by way of their context, how it builds on or contrasts to what came before. All historical writing is actually about the present, to paraphrase the historical philosopher R.G. Collingwood, who was one of those thinkers that I was exposed to in my PhD writing. The act of writing history is here and now. Good historical writing is compelling because it was written in response to issues and questions, not of the past, but of the present day. Histories are written and may be rewritten time and again because each time 
they seek answers to different questions, pertinent and meaningful to their moment, to which past experience offers infinite insight. Let me finish with a particularly apposite statement to this effect that Roger, uh, my fellow speaker and host on this occasion, provided in the epilogue to his own groundbreaking volume to, uh, on Finland to the same series that we published this book. So yes, I think, Roger, yours was the first book in that series, yeah. He didn't even mention that one, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why he didn't. You, you overlooked a rather significant book, I thought. Um, to, to, the, to the series which is importantly called Modern Architectures in the Plural in History. Um, and this is what Roger says late in, in his epilogue to that book. History is a contemporary unfinished narrative that must engage the very history it looks back on. Um, and, and he finishes by making a critique of how the contemporary um, Finnish architectural community was receptive or not to, to certain understandings of itself, but that how the sort of retrospective critical uh, revisitation through, through the historian's writing uh, craft, you know, gives them a chance to reflect upon that. In other words, the sort of architectural history that Roger and I have both evidently um, aspired to write is always, if anything, critical. So I'll leave you with that word and that thought and uh, thank you for your indulgence. The last speaker for today's morning session is architectural journalist Shiny Verghese, whose writing through journalism talk is titled Right to Do. Um, we would like um, Ma'am to please come on stage and receive this token of appreciation. Shiny Verghese is a leading columnist associated with the Indian Express. In her years of working as a journalist, she has worked on feature stories on education and environment, and is a regular publisher of articles co covering the topics of art, design, and architecture. She believes design pervades every aspect of our lives, even when we don't recognize it, from the spoon you eat with, to the car you drive, or the pavement you walk on. Good design for her is something that touches and redeems life. Some of her latest works include covering exhibitions such as Oats to Happiness and, Ga Ga and Gandhi Virasat Kazakala, studying the, studying the works of the only Indian Pritzker Prize winner, B.V. Doshi, looking at the latest craft initiatives in the country and their impact, as well as regularly featuring buildings, some of which include the Parliament Library Delhi, designed by Rajivar, and the Tata Consultancy Services Campus in Andheri, explaining the design ideologies and the ambience the form possesses. As of two days ago, she's also covered the seventh edition of the India Design ID as well. I would request her to take the stage, please. Hi, uh, good afternoon to all of you, and uh, let's hope we can work a good appetite before lunch happens. So um, I'm going to talk to you about, I'm 
Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be talking about uh, writing in three phases, in three, sp three parts. Uh, the first will be the right to do, your, your fundamental right as architects, and uh, what it means to what it means to write. Uh, the second part will be about, um, uh, th there'll be a bit of reading in between, so I think those of you who have books, I'll tell you how to go through it. Uh, the second part will be a few tips, and the third will be about my journey as a, a journalist who writes on architecture and design. Um, so yeah, this is a question to all of you, whoever would like to kind of answer this. What is your favorite design memory? It could be, it could be a building, it could be a, a stationery, it could be a book cover. Any volunteers? Yes, please. The Jali is creating. The shadows that the Jali is create. Oh, thank you. Um, what do you like about it? Is it, is it what you see? It's, it's the patterns? It might be the, the, the really nice stationery you hold on to, the notebook you hold on to, an eraser you've got when you were a child because you really liked that eraser so much. It could be anything. Anything that kind of spurred you on to what uh, design uh, can be. You didn't probably know it was design. Maybe it's a really nice bottle that you have where you drink water from. It could be a glass that your mother keeps in her crockery shelf. Um, Anything else? No? Mine is a difference. We're getting there, yes. It reminded me of a moment when we were just first year in architecture. We were taught architectural appreciation to the individuals. So making those connections was really mind-boggling It's a rite of passage because it's, it allows you to dream, it allows you to think, it, it shows you different landscapes. Ma'am, the uh, Amul comic that comes in Times of India every day, there's something new about it every day that comes. Okay. Like it's related to politics or either of the news. So it, it has something to say. It has basically. something to stay, uh, say every day. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, yes, please. Oh, fantastic. So it was really about what you could hold, what you could do, what you could uh, experience, what you could feel. Yeah? Okay, thank you so much. So this, uh, I'm sure many of you know what this uh, illustration is. Uh, have you read uh, Harun and the Sea of Stories? Have any of you any hands up? You've read Harun? Thank you. So um, basically this was uh, when Salman Rushdie had a fatwa on, fatwa on his head and he had to uh, stay away from family and he decided to write this book for his son. So it's a story about this uh, city that uh, has lost its name and uh, there's somebody, the ev the somebody who's, um, who's plugged the sea so it can't give you stories. And so here is Harun who's going to save the city. He's got his water genie with him and they're on a hoopie and they're going to save the city. So I'm going to read a portion out from there. Now the tale of the Moody land was one of Rashid Khalifa's best love stories. It was the story of a magical country that changed constantly according to the moods of its inhabitants. In the Moody land, the sun would shine all night if there was enough joyful people around and it would go on shining until the endless sunshine got on their nerves. Then an irritable night would fall, a night full of mutterings and discontent in which the air felt so thick to breathe. And when people got angry, the ground would shake. And when people were muddled or uncertain about things, the moody land got confused as well. The outlines of its buildings and lampposts and motor cars got smudgy, like paintings 
whose colors had run. And at such times, it would be difficult to make out whether one thing ended and the other began. Am I right? Harun asked his father. Is this the place the story was about? Um, the, the idea, the, the reason that I read out the story is to just bring one thing to your, um, into, your, into your imagination. It's basically what writing can do as a verb. Uh, I chose writing as a verb. Yesterday we, we were at that conference where uh, Alejandro Avera was talking about uh, how writing becomes, how architecture becomes a verb. And um, if architecture is a verb, what do you do? Verb are doing things. So uh, exactly the kind of uh, design memories that you had, uh, you can think, you can feel, you can see, you can hear, you can say, you can dream. Um, so I'm going to take you through some examples of what writing can do with each of these. Uh, I'm guessing, again, you're all familiar with uh, the heroes of uh, architecture. Uh, they were a group of really frustrated architects in the 60s who wanted to bring about social change. And what they gave us at the end, through their writings, through their pop culture, through their comic strips, was um, ev everything from Sun Sin City to Walk-In City to Plug City. And um, I think they questioned what, I mean, they, they questioned whether you need to actually build. And uh, I think that is what writing can do, that, that it takes you to a place where you begin to question everything, where you begin to think. Um, I, when I was introduced, I was told, uh, I, you know, you were, you were told that I had done a story on SPA. Um, SPA, I don't know if you guys know, and I'm sure many of you who are from SPA know that probably. You've all heard of Abdullah. So when I had finished all my, Abdullah is a ghost in SPA, okay? So when I had finished uh, all my research, I said, I'm going to be Abdullah, and the story is going to be about Abdullah, through Abdullah's eyes. My editor shot it down. And I said, okay, let me have a sutradhar who will kind of take you through the whole narrative and somebody will kind of, uh, you know, he or she will be the main narrator to the whole story. Again, it got shot down. But what I'm trying to say is that you really have to think of multiple ways, especially when you're writing uh, for a newspaper where you might have only 2,500 words and seven decades of a story to write. Um, what I've written is there for all of you to see, but... The next one, can writing help you feel? So uh, this is uh, K.L. Nader, who uh, had spoken at the workshop for uh, Griha in 2015. And what he says in this, the particular thing that I really like is that the architecture evolves in something deep inside. Um, in, in Jerry Pinto's um, Ed and the Big Oom, he, he talks about this dysfunctional family that they, that they have. And uh, he's got a mother who's uh, mentally afflicted. And yet the kind of humor that he brings in is, is so much of, you almost think it's free fall. So if I can get uh, Shushan to read from Ed and Begum is. Oh, yeah, please. Good afternoon, everyone. This was well into June. Susan and I hadn't had any need to study for over a month. There had been nothing to restrain him. She had exhausted herself and was with her uh, and us with her mania. I knew instantly that she was beginning the slide into depression. Perhaps it was a silence that had disturbed me and broken the spell of the blue god's arguments. M had laid a beady, but she was staring at the floor as if it might conceal a pattern or a story. After a few seconds, she shook her head like a dog, passed it by a fly, got up, stretched and said, time for another cuppa. I'll join you if I may, I said. No hope of my joining you while you make it, is there? She said, no, I thought not. Then she was in the kitchen and silent, and the slow sounds of the pan being put on the stove, the tins being opened, her feet dragging across the cramped space told me that she was sinking into night that the black drip had started inside her. I could not hold on to my karma defense for a little longer, but 
it was already uh, seeming thin how could you do how could you your how could you do your duty when you love back and you should do something else uh, thank you shushin um yeah so talking about uh, feeling i think as architects each of you and you will be tomorrow building um i think it's very important to remember what it means what it means for people whom you're building for what what does it feel like when you are in a particular when you're building for somebody in in that space i was recently at a project in um in amdabad baroda and uh, it's a new it's a new building it's uh, just been renovated it's it's just been oh, i think about a year old uh, it's a fabulous building from the outside you know it's got all the cotton steel and uh, really fantastically um uh, done up exteriors and you go inside it's still a box and the one thing that i thought um that um, the architect could have done was think about people who are in the box it's a private it's a private building but unfortunately i think the architect got so self conscious about making the building that he forgot what it meant for people inside the building to be working there for 8 or 10 hours uh without giving them a a glance of the sky so um when you when you build when you write i think feeling is a very important thing yeah write it like you mean it say it uh many of us know what marg and design magazine has done for us as a country of uh, designers artists architects uh, marg came out in 1946 Uh, that was done uh, mulkraj anand who was who's at that time quite a well known author himself had brought out this magazine to uh, kind of collate artworks and uh, write about them and it's in this uh, in mark to your left to your left is all the uh, i'm sorry i couldn't get individual images that's why there are just uh, cover photographs as representation but it was in mark that charles korea actually first uh, presented his um, Uh, with his colleagues presented the idea of what new bombay was and then it went on to become a policy so what writing can really do you know it can allow you to at least say what you want to say and then it's left up to um, you know where where na- nature and will will go design magazine was another fantastic i i really hope that you guys have access to it in some way because it's a fantastic magazine it's very difficult to get today you'll have to go through the archives uh meet uh, patwan singh's wife if it means for you to go and sit in the study but it is really fantastic because uh patwan singh did what uh, no other architect or writer at that moment was doing uh, critically talking about buildings so he came out around the late 50s 60s i think um sorry 57 that was the time when le corbusier was building chandigarh and um, what i really liked about what he said in one of his editorials is how he uh, deconstructed what chandigarh meant to the country so when nehru said you know it it's like a hit on our head you you really didn't know what was being said but uh, patwan singh put it very well he said corbusier's work in this country chandigarh more specifically shook india out of the architectural stupor it had been in since long it needed that shaking not that india lacks design talent but just that it was the right time to point to the possibilities which lay beyond our obsession with domes and chhatris so it was i thought a fantastic way to say something that we all already knew but we didn't know how to express it and uh, the design magazine could say you know the most picking thing in exactly 10 sentences which is i think it requires a certain skill to be able to do that um in in the columns that i'm writing currently on post independence buildings uh, there are times when i'm trying to do that when the nehru memorial when i uh, visited the nehru memorial and you saw how uh, professor rana had kind of uh, you know thought through the whole building and now this whole conversation about the new uh, museum that's going to come up on the campus it really it, it really some of the designs that are coming out are appalling so can we think about how we once upon time built can we uh is is it is it possible for me to write about these buildings so it allows us to use our past to work into our future um yeah 
this multitasking is too much to handle. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, can writing help you see? I think that's the most um, that's the most obvious thing that you as architects do. The visual. Each of you are either Instagramming or you are um, on some kind of social media that allows you to take images, and that's the first thing. I mean, we've all grown up with this I Spy kind of a game where you know you you it's a game you play when you are bored when you are traveling um, what it allows you to do is observe and accentuate your um, your accuracy your observation skills and this is what Vitruvius says the the man who is uh, I don't know proportion guru to all of you um, what what I like is what he says about how writing uh, assist your memory, like what uh, Roger was saying this morning. Uh, about it, 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 you might not even go back to those writing notes, but it really stays somewhere in the back of your mind. And um, I want to, I want to make you listen to to a small poem, which is by this um, English poet. And he writes on the conversational nature of reality. And uh, I'll just play it for you. Your great mistake, your great mistake is to act the drama as if you were alone. Your great mistake is to act the drama as if you were alone. As if life were a progressive and cunning crime with no witness to the tiny hidden transgressions. To feel abandoned is to deny the intimacy of your surroundings. Surely even you at times have felt the grand array, the swelling presence, and the chorus crowding out your solo voice. You must note the way the soap dish enables you, or the window latch grants you courage. Alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. Alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. The stairs are your mentor of things to come. The doors have always been there to frighten you and invite you. And the tiny speaker in the phone is your dream ladder to divinity. The tiny speaker in the phone is your dream ladder to divinity. Put down the weight of your aloneness and ease into the conversation. The kettle is singing even as it pours you a drink. The cooking pots have left their arrogant aloofness and seen the good in you at last. All the birds and creatures of the world are unutterably themselves. Everything, everything, everything is waiting for you. Yeah, when we talk about seeing, it's that attention to detail that each of you are uh, taught to do. It's that kind of conversational nature of uh, reality that uh, David White talks about. And um, this is Degas' uh, paintings. He's a French artist. And he did, um, he, he called himself a realist because he actually portrayed what French ballerinas were, what kind of lives they led uh, backstage. So. Uh, what I liked about his paintings is what George uh, Berger says in the, the same person who wrote Ways of Seeing. He said, in Degas' compositions with several dancers, their steps and postures and gestures often resemble the most geometric, formal letters of an alphabet, whereas their bodies and their heads are recalcitrant, sinuous, and individual. Uh, I don't know if you can see letters in their dance, but yeah, well, I saw some. Uh, talking about seeing, um, when I had done a pro when I had gone visiting some of DD contractors' works, it was a big meditation hall in one of the centers she had done, and uh, it was kind of it gave a kind of a 360 degree uh, no 180 degree view of the whole valley because it's right above the hills, way beyond the clouds. And I was standing there with all that I could see were the trees at some point, and. Uh, for some reason, I sat. When I sat down is when I saw the sky. And I thought that was a fabulous way which, which I wouldn't have seen if I didn't sit down. So when, when you're writing, it's very important to do different things. It's not, you cannot possibly write with only your two feet. You need to sit, you need to feel, you need to experience things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can writing help you here? Uh, I'm going to get Rishabh to read one of my favorite authors, uh, Michael Ondaatje, 
and he's going to read a poem where uh, Ondaatje compares somebody's voice to, to multiple things using similes. Uh, can I have Risha back, please? Afternoon, all. Your voice sounds like a scorpion being pushed through a glass tube, like someone has just trod on a peacock, like wind howling in a coconut, like a rusty Bible, like someone pulling barbed wire across a stone courtyard, like a pig drowning, of a taka being fried, a bone shaking hands, a frog singing at Carnegie Hall, like a crow swimming in milk, like a nose being hit by a mango, like the crowd at the Royal Thomian match, a womb full of twins, a pariah dog with a magpie in its mouth, like the midnight jet from Casablanca, like Air Pakistan curry, a typewriter on fire, like a spirit in the gas which cooks your dinner, like a hundred paparins being crunched. Thank you, Rishabh. So yeah, it's, it's taking that one thing called as somebody's voice and taking it into different textural, into different uh, audible visuals that you and I identify with. Writing can do that. This, I think this is a book that's familiar with everybody and everybody knows the stories. So I will just read a small portion of it. For those of you who don't know, um, The Little Prince is, uh, it ca he comes to, he, the narrator and the Little Prince meet and the Little Prince lives on this asteroid. And then they go about discovering different landscapes, different planets. I have a reason to believe that the planet from which the little prince came is the asteroid known as B612. If I had told you these details about the asteroid and made a note of its number for you, it is on no account of the grown-ups and their ways. Grown-ups love figures. When you tell them that you have made a, few, a new friend, they never ask you any questions about essential matters. They never say to you, what does his, so what does his voice sound like? What games does he like best? Does he collect butterflies? Instead, they demand, how old is he? How many brothers does he have? How much does he weigh? How much money does his father make? Only from these figures do they think they can learn about him at all. If you were to say to the grown-ups, I saw a beautiful house made of rosy bricks with geraniums in the windows and doves on the, f of, on the roof, they would not be able to get any idea of the house at all. If you had to say to them, I saw a house that cost 4,000 pounds, then they would exclaim, oh, what a pretty house. So yeah, architecture loves you to dream. And uh, little, I, couldn't, I couldn't not take Little Prince, I had to. Um, and I, I think while while we all, while I write in a newspaper, which really is about the reality today, it's also about being able to understand what other things can happen. So yeah, I, I'm constantly searching for new new things to do. Mm. Just a few tips, because those of you who are interested, you can't be a writer if you if you don't read. So that's also why I wanted to introduce you to different kinds of authors. Um, it's all about getting different points of view. Uh, it's all about writing the story through somebody else, uh, being in somebody else's shoes. Do your homework, research. Be it a light bulb or a monument or a street or a city. Look up magazines, books, films, anything that you can to. And, and honestly, Wiki is not an answer. Quite often, a lot of young interns who come to us assume that Wiki is the only source it isn't. Um, Cultivate your sources, meet people. Writing, especially when it's not about uh, fictional writing, re requires a lot of uh, speaking to people, which as a journalist you always have to do. And it's, it's really not about showing off what you know. It is really about asking that person, what happened next? Yeah, point of view. Like what uh, Ada Huxley said, sometimes you, you may not afford a car or a house, but you can certainly afford a point of view. And through, so the question is, through whose eyes do you want to tell the story? And lastly, discipline. I've kept it right at the bottom because that's the most difficult part, really. 
if you have to be a writer, you have to have the discipline to be able to write, even if it means 200 words a day, but do that writing. And go with an open mind, don't be prejudiced. It quite, quite often happens that prejudices are easy to come by, but it, it requires some skill to not do that. Uh, yeah, words and walls. If you've all heard of this word called hook, it, it's, it's really how do you bring your reader in? Are there, it, it, it's, it's really like a shock and awe kind of thing because your reader has got a lot of other things to do. What will make him or her come to your copy or to your article? So it could be anything that you begin your uh, writing with from something that's completely contrary to what you actually want to say to um, probably something that happened in a time gone by. It could possibly be a whole ri life rehearsal, uh, reversal if it's about a rich man, it could be about when he actually started his first uh, store. Uh, write as you speak. That's often the most difficult, difficult part for all of us to, to not get into jargon, to not uh, get into uh, words that we don't understand the meaning of and, and that somebody else will not understand the meaning of. So write as you speak. Write as you're speaking to a friend. Uh, throughout adjectives, adverbs, anything that ends with L while greatly, please t take it away. Simplicity. Now, as architects, you're all familiar with the less is more. And um, in our writer's world, it, it really is about that. And as, as, as a writer, as an editor, it's one of our biggest challenges to be able to uh, make text legible to the reader. It, even if you're doing a line drawing, for instance, there are things that you leave out. So the question is, what will you leave out? Chronology and sequence, there's always a timeline. So get that sequence right. If you're profiling a person, if it's a story of a building, go back to facts. The spatial relation and the experience, and that's something that is very close to my heart because I try as much as I can to write from what I feel if I'm walking into a space, does the building talk to me? How does my body feel in that space? Is it enough to say that the floor is marble and the wall is a Hussein, has a Hussein painting? How does the light stream in? What happens in the dark spaces? Does it feel like a Rembrandt painting? When I walk barefoot, do the pebbles prick? Reflection and transparency. What is the space, the city? What does it do to you as a person? Uh, this is the last reading which Vishwesh, Vishwesh will do. Yeah, it's on Teju Kohl, the writer who is also a journalist, and this is about his experience in Rome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I visited Rome in the vanning of winter at the Spanish steppes where even in winter tourists swarm. There was a lithe African men doing a brisk trade in Prada and Gucci bags. The men were young, personable, as was required for sales. But at other mom moments, full of melancholy, the bags were arranged on white cloths, not at all far from the luxury shops that sold the same goods for 10 to 20 times more. It was late, late afternoon, beautiful yellow light enfolded the city and from the top of the steps the dome of St. Peter's was visible as was the Geniculum Hill on the other side of the Tiber. In that light the city had an eternal aspect and illumination seemed to come from the earth and glow up into the sky. Not the particular way around did I sense in myself just then a shift a participation, however momentary, in what Rome was. There was a sudden commotion with a great whoosh. The African brothers raised up the steps. Their white cloths now caught at the corners and converted into bulging stacks on their black backs. One after the other, then in pairs, they fled upwards, past where I stood. Tourists shrank out of their way. I spun around and pressed the, pressed the shutter. Far below, cars carrying. The military police arrived, but by then, the brothers had gone. Later, I looked at the image on my camera, 
the last of the angels vanishing up the long flight of steps, a hurry through which known and strange things pass, their white wings flashing in the setting sun. Thank you. So um, this is Teju Cole after he has seen this experience, uh, after he has been through this experience of uh, seeing these uh, fake uh, bags selling Africans in Roma on the streets in, in front of the Spanish steps. What it does to him is how it changes the texture of what the city itself is. Because until then, Roma is a very different place. He's seeing the art, he's, he's been to the forum, he's, uh, he's seen everything that a tourist would see and what an architect writer would see. And then he sees this, which adds that human element into the thing, into the whole equation, because he sees these people who are just wanting to make a living, and then they flee. And that is what he calls uh, the angels of the day. Um, yeah. yeah. So having done all, break the rules. I guess you're all familiar with uh, E. Cummings, who was, um, he was a US poet and he had been to France to volunteer for World War I, and then he met Picasso, and then this happened. I'm guessing you can all read it, so I won't read it. Writers ask stupid questions. They look at the sun and ask if it's shining. We often do that. As journalists, we often do that. So there's, there's a meme where you're standing in the, uh, in, in the center of the earthquake, and somebody is asking you, Apo kesa lag raha hai? Because that's really how we, um, but yeah, that's, that's about it. My journey, how I moved from a noun to a verb. So uh, I started my uh, journalism in uh, Bangalore. And at that point, I didn't know I was going to do architectural journalism till I came to Delhi. Uh, in my other jobs, I was writing other things. I read a magazine called Design Today, which was at that point part of the India Today group. The magazine has shut now, but at that, they, they had a fantastic article. Uh, it was a series actually on design, on the design movements, and how different objects that were um, designed. What, how did that influence society, and how society influenced design? So I thought that was a fantastic magazine to work with, and I asked them for a job. They gave me the job, and for the next six years. That is what we were doing. We were trying to understand products. So it was at that stage where, uh, like I said, it was a noun. So it, it didn't hold any connection to life itself because you were either uh, doing a tap by a client or you were either featuring a tile by somebody else, bringing out magazines which were on lighting. I, I'm sure that you've seen that. You know? You've seen your, your design magazines are full of it. Um, it's only when I came to the Indian Express that I had the opportunity to look at design in a very different way. It is not that it didn't start at uh, Design Today. We had columnists who were fantastic and who were showing us the different ideas of what architecture can be, of what design can be. Um, and then in Indian Express happened where I got the freedom to not have to talk to a CEO, to not have to talk to a company to do my copy. I could write about people. I could write about what was happening to them. So some of the best stories I've done is what I have enjoyed. I, I don't know about my um, audience, but uh, it was soon after Muzaffar Nagar riots had happened, and we had to go there to understand how people were building. And the kind of um, courage they had to leave everything behind because uh, people who, were, who they thought were friends were no longer their friends, who they, they had to walk over dead bodies to be able to flee to a to a place that's completely alien to them. And then how do you build your lives again? What, is it, what, what does it take? There's something more than just brick and mortar that it takes. So it's these kind of stories that I thought were fantastic and needed to be told. And um, so, so I, I, if, if, it were to, if, if I were to look at it like the seven stages of man that I'm sure that you're all familiar with of Shakespeare's plays, um, poem, um, I had come to the point in, uh, in my career where I, just when I thought that, oh, I've, I've done so much, uh, I've written so much, is when I came across the Death of Architecture exhibition. And uh, that exhibition, I, I really thought was like a wake 
to say, okay, let's come and mourn about what that architecture doesn't exist at all. And um, in Seven Stages of Man, it's at death that Shakespeare stops. But I thought we, being Indians, there is always rebirth. And that rebirth happened right there at the death of, uh, death of architecture exhibition, which was uh, when this architect called Leo Pereira, who is um, who's one of the, he's a monk, he's quiet, and, but does fantastic work. And a student such as you had asked him a question, saying, um, when, when our life is in such a flux, and there's so, the technology is changing, and our lifestyles are changing, how do we design a home in that kind of an environment? And Leo said something fantastic. He said, focus on the family. The walls don't matter. And I thought that was the most beautiful expression to say that you know, architecture can still happen if we just focus on the people. And I'll close um, with what uh, Mr. Doshi had said at the exhibition. This was at, uh, at the closing of the exhibition. It was at the Milonas where he was talking about what, uh, what we imagine architecture to be and what architecture is not. He was seated in his lawn with his family uh, on a day in the evening when uh, it was just about to rain. The rain came and at that time each one who was doing their own different thing uh, suddenly got up and there was this whole rearrangement of things happening. Somebody was going to pick up the clothes, somebody was going to shut a window, somebody was going to make pakoras. Everything had changed in, that, in the time that the rain came. And his point was that you don't need a rug, a curtain, and, or, or, or you know, a really nice uh, sofa to ch rearrange your life. What you need is to understand what nature can do. It was, of course, classic doshi, but I thought the ex that, that context was fabulous. Yeah. And this is the last uh, of my slides, which is a poem by a Kenyan uh, poet called Shailaja Patel. On your breast, a pulse, you fit words to one by one. Breathe, see, choose. Truth, work, love. You will wake with your fingers wrapped around them. Breathe, see, choose. Wake with them, salty under your tongue. Truth, work, love. They hold your right of return to the country of childhood. They map where you will stand in the scorched erupting soil. Breathe, see, choose. They are your passport to morning. It's from the book called The Movements of Movements, uh, Rethinking Our Dance by Jess. Thank you so much. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, I think we should break for lunch and reconvene at 2 o'clock. On the tables, please. <laughs> <laughs>